Greetings, nature nerds, and welcome back to Ask an Ecologist. My name is Suzanne Simpson, and I'm an ecologist for Bayou Land Conservancy here in Houston, Texas. And today I am coming to you from Lake Houston um, in the Kingwood area. And this was an, an area that luckily was really spared any impact from Hurricane Laura that came through the area last night and this morning. Um, but our hearts are certainly with those in Southeast Texas and Southwest Louisiana that uh, experienced the worst of that category four and are still experiencing it as it moves uh, upward uh, to Louisiana. Um, so I hope that you guys are all safe and, uh, and doing, doing well. Um, I've got a nice bald cypress behind me today and a, a lovely lake. So uh, I'm enjoying having this background for uh, Ask an Ecologist today. Because we still have about four to five weeks left of hurricane season, one thing that we'll be addressing today is things that you can do to help wildlife um, before and, and after major storm events. And uh, that's gonna be our, our primary topic for this episode, but we're going to get to some of your other questions first. We had a lot of questions submitted this week, so if I don't get to you today, promise that your questions are going to be answered uh, in, a, in an, uh, a subsequent episode. So our first question comes from Charlie Rospierski, who asked, I saw what I believe was a Cooper's hawk in Cyprus. Was he migrating or more resident? So last week we talked about fall migration. And as a matter of fact, you could see the fall migrants in the uh, Doppler in the eye of, of the hurricane. And that is one thing that migrants will try to do and, and uh, shorebirds will try to do is fly in the eye of the hurricane. Um, but in terms of, of Cooper's Hawks, we get both resident and migrant Cooper's Hawks. But given that you were in Cyprus and not along the, the coast of Texas, more likely that's a resident Cooper's Hawk. They will be here year round. They're short or medium uh, migrants. They don't go on really, really long migratory journeys. So we have a lot of year round resident Cooper Hawks, uh, Cooper's Hawks. So that's probably what you saw. David wants to know, what invasive plant poses the most danger to Houston's natural environment? Tallow, water hyacinth, plants that we should be talking about? So, David, there isn't one invasive plant that is the absolute worst for, for all of Houston. Reason being, we have um, multiple different ecosystems in Houston and different types of invasive plants are more detrimental to certain ecosystems. Uh, the Chinese tallow that you mentioned is absolutely a notable one because it affects both prairies and forests. So one of the main reasons that um, animals like the Atwater prairie chicken have ended up on the endangered species list is, first of all, their habitat has been paved over. And secondly, the invasive Chinese tallow has turned the prairie habitats that they prefer into forests because they grow so quickly, they're so difficult to manage, and as a result, there's habitat loss from the Chinese tallow. In addition, um, wetlands and air, especially areas that have been recently disturbed, that gives the tallow an inlet to populate those areas. And so wetlands and forested ecosystems have also seen impacts from the Chinese tallow. So that certainly makes it a notable invasive that is a problem citywide. You mentioned water hyacinth, and certainly that is a challenge uh, in open water habitats. Also, uh, giant salvinia is a, is a challenge in open water habitats and, and, and alligator weed. Um, in another prairie, um, a plant that really tends to take over prairies is McCartney rose. Um, it was it, it has been planted for a, like a boundary, like instead of having a fence or in addition to having a fence, you could also plant that because it, it is so difficult to travel through, very thorny, very thick. Um, and so it does that job well, but it also can take over your entire plot of land. So McCartney Rose is another really challenging plant that uh, landowners have to, have to deal with. And then salt cedar and Brazilian vervain are two um, plants that are very challenging in coastal environments and in both estuaries um, and bays and the marshy habitats. Those are two, two species that are really challenging there. So each ecosystem that we have, and we have so many, um, has its own little suite of invasive species that is challenging to them. And, and I haven't even come close to naming all of the ones that impact those areas, but that gives you an idea of some of the heavy hitters. Our next question, Carmen asked, um, what problems are nutria causing to Houston's natural environment? 
Are there any plans to eradicate them? So this is another invasive species question. If you're not familiar with nutria, Nutria are uh, native to South America. They were brought to this area by fur traders and also to um, reduce vegetation because they eat vegetation so rapidly. And if you've, if you've never seen one before, think of a small beaver and instead of a paddle tail, you have a long cylindrical rat tail. So that's the main way that I recognize them in the field because I usually see them from far away um, as I look for the tail. Is it, is it a beaver tail or is it more of a rat tail? And then I know it's a nutria. Nutria have been a problem because they can burrow into banks and cause damage. They could even cause like bank collapse in the most extreme circumstances. They certainly would hasten erosion through that, uh, through that behavior. And they've also caused a lot of damage to sugarcane uh, uh, farms, sugarcane plant, um, and those sorts of crops, uh, because they do eat so much vegetation, they can really clear a field. And so they end up causing millions and millions of dollars in damage. We do have, um, a nutria, you know, invasive population in Texas. It is even worse in Louisiana. Um, they sort of occupy the same ecological niche and have a lot of the same life history characteristics as beavers but I've never seen any evidence that nutria populations are actually reducing beaver populations. We have pretty healthy beaver populations um, here in, in East Texas for sure. Um, so the, the, main, the main problems with nutria are they're causing habitat loss, they can uh, make banks vulnerable to collapse or erosion, uh, and they can cause damage to agricultural fields. So uh, the second part of your question was, are there any plans to eradicate them? So eradicating an invasive species once it's established in an area is extremely difficult. And in this case, we have nutria not just established in Texas, but also very, very well established in Louisiana. So for there to be a total eradication effort at nutria, it would have to be a multi-state cooperative, very, very aggressive trapping effort. And that takes a tremendous amount of coordination and resources. So in most situations, you're not going to be able to, eradication isn't going to be an achievable goal. Instead, what people tend to do, what landowners that are having trouble with nutria tend to do, is um, engage in localized trapping efforts. So localized trapping efforts on their land to catch and remove the nutria. And that's a temporary solution because of course animals will move in and out. So you'll be nutria free for a while, but they may return later. Um, but it's certainly better than nothing if you're struggling with uh, damage from nutria. So I hope that helps answer your question, but eradicating an invasive species is extremely difficult once it's established, which is why the best way for us to prevent damage from invasive species is stopping them before they ever get there. All right, our last question comes from Natalie Freitas who asks, is there anything we can do to help wildlife stay safe and recover from large storms and hurricanes? Well, before the storm, something that you can do is set up sort of micro refugia in your backyard. Remember that your backyards are really, really important ecosystems for wildlife. We've talked about before creating things like uh, tree frog homes. We've talked about creating possum homes. Um, people have asked about raccoon homes. So having that, those types of areas where a, wild, a, a member of, of a wildlife community can sort of hunker down and um, brave out the storm is something that at least gives them a better chance of surviving, especially if it is a hurricane that has really strong winds. Um, those can be particularly damaging to wildlife homes and their food sources. Um, after the storm, uh, what you can do is check under downed limbs and branches and see if there's any injured wildlife underneath it. You always wanna be really careful, um, you know, make sure that you're using uh, heavy gloves because you never know how an animal is gonna respond in a situation like that. Um, if you see a bird or a mammal that is really wet and kind of stunned, you can help dry them off and give them some time to recover. And then if, if a bird you know, is able to fly, then let it fly away. Or if an animal's ready to run back, then let them, let them do their thing. 
but if the animal appears injured or is just not recovering uh, in a way that's that it, it can get away from you, there are many wildlife rescues um, around that always get an influx of animals after uh, hurricanes. So you want to make sure that the animal is actually injured. Keep in mind that these places are getting a ton of admittance after this time. So you want to make sure that the animal needs to be taken to a wildlife rescue. Um, but if you are in Houston, I'll just name a few of them off the top of my head. There's um, Texas Wildlife Rehabilitation Center, the Wildlife Center of Texas, um, Houston, SPCA. I'm, I'm sure I've missed at least one. Um, and if you're not in Houston, you can always just Google wildlife rehabilitation centers near you and admit the animals that way. I hope that's helpful. Um, these storms are not just really damaging and traumatizing to us humans. They can be absolutely world changing for the wildlife that we cohabitate with. So anything that you can do to help give them a leg up is great. That's going to be all for this week. Next week, we are going to talk about some sharks of the Gulf Coast. So if you have any shark questions that you've been dying to ask, you can always uh, send us an email to info at bayouland.org. You can drop it in the comments. You can send Bayou Land Conservancy a Facebook message. And we look forward to talking with you next week. See you then.